Welcome to Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning for Monday, September 16th. I'm your host, Tom Orr, the Marshall game in five days, the game against Michigan in 75 days. During a normal Ohio State game weekend, this would be the show you'd be where you'd be hearing from all the things the Buckeyes said after the game. Well, there was no game on Saturday, so we're going to be talking about something a little different today. We did a live Michigan Monday show on Sunday. Again, we're a little off of our normal schedule, but we're ahead. That's good news. So we're not going to talk about the Michigan Wolverines on this show, but if you want to hear us talk about the Michigan Wolverines, you can find that in the Buckeye Weekly podcast feed. However, today we're going to be talking about some of the biggest surprises of the college football season so far. We're going to be doing that with our buddy Tony Gerderman at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Tony, I, I know there's a lot of different directions we could go here, but there is a team that was top 10 in the preseason poll that is currently 0-3 and just lost to Memphis at home, and oh boy, the Florida State Seminoles have not been a good surprise, that's for sure. No, and I think I think we probably mentioned that they were overrated to begin with this season, but when you watch them, and I think some of us did over the weekend, and just as we drove past, just continued to turn our neck and stare at the horror. And I know DJ Uyunglele gets a lot of the blame, and some of it is... Uh, earned, but nobody on that team is playing well. Like, he'll throw passes that hit people in the hands and the ball just bounces right out or, you know, penalties or this, that. Like, it seems like everybody has quit at the, on that team at this point, except for that coach. And it's, it's really, really bizarre. And I wonder how much of this is you, you lost a bunch of guys. You lose Jordan Travis, you know, quarterback. So that you're going to take a step back, but. When they were as reliant on the portal as they were last year, and not only do you lose those guys, but then when you're all when reli- you're reliant on the portal, what does that do to your overall team culture and the stability of it? Because it's really a, a dramatic and a dramatic fall to go from thirteen and zero or twelve and zero to to this. This should not happen. No, this should definitely not happen. And looking ahead. There's a lot of games on the schedule that you would have had as easy wins before the season. They got Cal coming in. I will remind everyone, Cal just went into Auburn and beat Auburn. So Cal is not a gimme. They have to go to SMU. Then they've got Clemson at home. They go to Duke. They go to Miami, North Carolina at home, at Notre Dame. That gets you, and then they have you know a couple off weeks mixed in there. That gets you to Saturday, November 23rd, and the Charleston Southern Buccaneers, which is the first. Absolutely, they will win that game on the calendar. They should win several of the other ones, but oh boy, this is definitely not the season that uh, I think anyone was expecting coming in for Florida State. Uh, next up, let's talk a little bit about the Georgia Bulldogs. Uh, there has been some pieces of this that that have been very expected. They absolutely destroyed Clemson. They had another player get uh, arrested for drag racing last week, so that was pretty expected. And then they went to Croker Field in Lexington, Kentucky, and all that was standing between them and a loss was some nightmarish decision making by Can- uh, Kentucky head coach Mark Stoops. I went on a long and extended rant on that on Twitter on Saturday night. If you'd like my thoughts there, but Tony, this is a team that we have just sort of written in almost in pen as here's the number one team in the nation for a lot of this year, and I think a lot of people have done that. And then you watch them against against Georgia and the. Offense did not look very good at all. The defense felt like, boy, they, they were, how many broken tackles did the defense uh, for Georgia have, especially the defensive front? That just, I know that the games up in Kentucky are always weird for Georgia for some reason. So I, this is, this is definitely not, you know, five, five uh, alarm fire concern for Georgia right now. But boy, that sure was a surprising performance and not in a good way for the Georgia Bulldogs on Saturday night. No, and it kind of reminds me of Rocky IV when R- Rocky cuts Drago, and they, everybody, everybody sees that Drago can bleed. Like this is this is Georgia bleeding at this point, and it's as as you said, like this against Kentucky every year. You, you, they don't they don't score a lot, and things are just ugly. I did hear somebody on the radio mention, "Hey, it was raining. There was a little bit of rain, so you got to factor that in for Georgia's offense as well." But you, you're watching this and you're wondering, where are the playmakers? Where, where are all, all of the big plays? And how is this the same Kentucky team that lost 31 to six to South Carolina the week before? And, and maybe Georgia, that's maybe Georgia was expect, expecting that team and they got this team. And I don't know why they would, 
um, overlook a, a program that consistently gives them just a fight. So it, it's just interesting to me that uh, you see the possibilities. I think everybody sees that everybody that will run up against Georgia will can look and and say, well, okay, I see a way forward here. And it's not unlike when Ohio State was getting ready to play Georgia. You and I went back and watched five Georgia games, including against Kentucky. And we were talking about there is there is a path forward here for for Ohio State or for somebody else. And I think a lot of people saw that in this one. Yeah, it definitely. It looked like a Georgia team that was beatable for really the first time this season, probably. Tre- they rushed for 3.4 yards per carry. Trevor Etienne, 4.2 yards per carry. But Carson Beck, 15 for 24, 160 yards. There just was not a lot of anything there for the most part. And a little bit of concern about the playmakers on the outside, a little bit of concern about the offensive line, a little bit of concern about the defense and how many missed tackles they had. It was. It was not a particularly inspiring uh, performance by any means. We will see how the dogs bounce back. Again, as you said, they had a game a lot like this in 2022 and then ended up going on to win the national championship and win, winning 65-7 to seven or whatever it was in the national championship game. So turned out they could be a dominant team after all that year. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on it, but that is definitely something that was a little uncharacteristic for the Georgia Bulldogs. You do wonder if that was uh, one of these one of those games you're going to look back later in the year and say, well, they had plenty of chances to lose and teams just couldn't finish. That was definitely one where y- you could feel Kentucky exactly how Kentucky was going to lose that game, even in the first half as Mark Stoops is settling for field goals and not taking an extra shot at the end zone before halftime and kicking field goals on fourth and one. And it was just like this, my man, my man, you are not going to win this game with four field goals. I am very sorry to tell you. Uh, next up. The Oregon Ducks, and this is a team that came into the season with Ohio State slash Georgia slash Texas caliber expectations, and for two weeks of the season, very much did not look like they belonged in that conversation. A very close win over Idaho, a very close win over Boise State, and even a first half that was pretty close against Oregon State. It was 22-14, to I think, at halftime. And then in the second half in Corvallis, that was the first time that Oregon looked like the Oregon that we were expecting. It looked like the things were sort of settling in in the trenches. They sort of started to find their playmakers, and they finally got the car out of second gear. Yeah, and it's interesting because you're watching this or getting ready to watch it, and you see what happened the weeks before, and you're thinking, Oregon going on the road, there is a possibility of an upset here. And it was you know back and forth in the first quarter. They're throwing punches at each other. Then that second half happens, and you know, Dylan Gabriel's hitting the throws that a couple of times he's missed over the, the course of the season to this point, even though he's throwing completely 80% of his passes. There are some that, if he would just, you know, some deep shots against uh, Boise State, uh, for instance, that could have put that one out of reach. They put this one out of reach in a number of ways, rushing for 240 yards, throwing for 306. And even you even got Dante Moore in the game, which I don't think people necessarily expected at quarterback. But Dylan Gabriel, 20 of 24, is just very, very accurate right now. And the receivers that they have are playmaking receivers, and they have a playmaking tight end as well. So if if when they're throwing short, which they will do, if you don't tackle the guy as soon as he gets the ball, look out because any one of those guys, like Tez Johnson, Trishon Holden, those guys can go, and Evan Stewart is a you know, is, is a downfield guy as well. So they've got a, a bunch of weapons. It just took a while for them to come together as as a unit. and then. You know, I still think there's they're not great stopping the run right now. I, I think there there's there's a path forward when you look at the Oregon defense. You might get into a bit of a shootout with them, but um, I think um, you also want to take it a little slower with Oregon at this point. Try to keep their offense off the field as much as possible. But I think this is a good, obviously good to, to see from Oregon because this is the team we've been expecting. This was this was the team we were promised, and it's the first time we've seen it. Now, is this the outlier, or is this Jim? This just uh, you know finally, as you said, getting out of second gear and moving forward in, in the the speed of which we were expecting. Oregon feels like the team that was the most don't read too much into week one and week two. We say that every year. You don't want to overreact to the first week or two. Sometimes teams are sort of figuring things out sorting out personnel, sorting out scheme, whatever it is. 
the fact that you saw Oregon look like that for a half, that is sort of what you expected Oregon to look like. So my assumption is you will see much more of that moving forward. I think the big concern for Ohio State was, will that only show up during the Ohio State game or will they be able to, will that, will that show up beforehand so you don't get completely ambushed? So now you've seen it. So now you sort of, you know, okay, don't go in and say, well, they only beat Idaho by 10 points. So of course, Ohio State's going to win by 40. Mm, that, that might be a not so fast, my friends. That should still be, still expecting that to be a very, very good football game in Eugene on October 12th. But before we get to that, we got to talk about a couple other Big Ten teams that have been a little surprising. One to me is Penn State, Tony, because I think Penn State is in a lot of ways what we sort of expected them to be, which is good, but not necessarily elite, elite. They're probably on the level below Ohio State and Oregon. So in that way, they're kind of exactly what we expected. But the offense, the offense has been one of the best in the country in terms of a lot of the yards per play kind of metrics, yards per pass attempt kind of metrics. But they're getting there in a way that's very reminiscent of the 2023 Michigan team, where there's just not a lot of throwing. There's not a lot happening with the wide receivers. It's really, they're running the ball. They're throwing about 17 passes a game. The majority of them are going to tight ends, but it's a lot of ground and pound hit the tight ends on play action, and the the, um, the lack of productivity out of the Penn State wide receivers, for the most part, there have been a couple big plays, but boy, I think the lack of productivity for the Penn State wide receivers, not necessarily a complete shock, but certainly would be a concern to me. Yeah, like, who do you fear there, and who is the matchup problem for you? And I don't know that there is a matchup problem for a, a team like Ohio State or a team with a, a two really good corners when you look at what Penn State has, I, to me, it, it's very similar to Michigan. Worry about the tight end, and as long as the tight end doesn't beat you, you're going to be okay with what happens with your corners on their receivers, especially if your quarterback isn't all that uh, accurate downfield. And and we know that Drew Aller has his ups and his downs. Trying to become more aggressive downfield, we'll see how it plays out when they're in a in a tougher environment or against a tougher defense. I also, you know, they're running the ball pretty well right now. Nick Singleton, I think, has three rushes of forty yards or more. He, he has he's carried the ball twenty six times this year. He's averaging nine yards a carry. Only six of his twenty six carries have gone for more than ten yards, but four of those have gone for like thirty. So he's he's created um, a bit of a bubble on what he's doing. So we'll see if that bursts or if he can continue to make big plays. We, we've seen it before from him We saw as a true freshman, but last year, neither him or Katron Allen and the other running back were all that explosive. And Katron Allen right now averaging five yards a carry. Uh, so, I, you know, there's there's plenty to work with with the running game. Maybe you can do some play action and, and continue to use that downfield stuff. I the, the, Thankfully, the Penn State defense against Bowling Green a week ago got better as the game went on because they were giving up a ton of yards in that first half. Then they pretty much shut them down in that second half. So like, what is, what is the situation with the Penn state defense as well? Because if you can allow that to happen to you, that first half against Bowling Green, but also do pretty well against West Virginia, I, I, I still think there's, there's some mystery here on both sides of the ball for Penn state. Yeah, and just to go back to the wide receivers real quickly, just pulling up the stats from the Bowling Green game, Tyler Warren, tight end, eight catches on eight targets, 146 yards. Long of 30, 72 yards after the catch. In you know That is incredible productivity, regardless of position. The top three wide receivers for Penn State, Amari Evans, Julian Fleming, the former Ohio State transfer, of course, and Harrison Wallace, a combined nine targets, three catches, 37 yards. You're averaging about four yards per attempt to your wide receivers in a game against a max secondary. That's a problem. That is a concern. That is not, well, the game plan was we just weren't going to throw the wide receivers. That is that is a big red flag to me. We'll see how that ends up shaking out. They're probably not the only team in the Big Ten with some quarterback slash wide receiver concerns. Did I mention we did a live Michigan Monday on Sunday? Well, you want to hear more about that. You can probably hear about that on that show. Last of all, Tony. This is a pleasant surprise in the Big Ten, although it was one we sort of had telegraphed to us a little bit at Big Ten Media Days. Kurt Signetti and the Indiana Hoosiers, they were picked to finish last or next to last in the conference, depending on who you ask. 
They are currently 3-0, already halfway to hitting their over on their season win total. An impressive win Saturday night at UCLA. The Indiana Hoosiers, Kurt Signetti, this may be, you know, led by former Ohio Bobcat Curtis Rourke at quarterback. This may be a team that is going to surprise someone this season. You know, it's we, we simplify it, or I'll simplify it by you look at who they get in the portal and you see Curtis Rourke, who's done a lot of really good things at Ohio, was injured last year, but has shown the potential to be a leader of a productive offense, can run, can throw. So immediately that gives you some hope that he can create things out of bad situations, make something good out of something bad, but also just lead a program. And, you know, he took them into Pasadena and, uh, you know, to the Rose Bowl. First Indiana quarterback, and who knows how long to take take the Hoosiers to the Rose Bowl. But you look at this, they had touchdown drives of 75 yards, 90 yards, 87 yards, 75 yards. So this is these aren't necessarily flukes. This is just a consistent, um, constant offensive effort from Indiana. They're, what, averaging 50-some points per game now, the lead the Big Ten in points, and they're not giving up many points either. So uh, it is interesting that Kurt Signetti is like the one guy, you'd, let's go hang out. Let's, uh, let's go meet at the local barbecue. We'll sit down for a few hours. We'll have some food, have some drinks, and just hear it. All kinds of trash talk about how, uh, about whatever you want, because he, he's a lot of fun to be around. And it's not, um, it's not just talk. He, he will admit that some of it is talk. Like when he did his Jim Trestle basketball speech, when he's introduced to the crowd, uh, when he got hired, introduced to a basketball crowd. And, you know, he's, he's on the court there and he's finishing up. And then he says, and Purdue sucks. And then the crowd goes crazy. And he's like, and so do Ohio State and Michigan. And then it's like, what is going on with this man? And you're seeing some results now. I don't know how much of this is just, uh, you know, fool's gold or whatnot. But I do know that past Indiana teams have not been able to do this. And so, you know, it's Florida, Illinois. It's Florida Atlantic, or Florida, Florida International, Western Illinois, and UCLA. And then next, next coming up is Charlotte. So they're going to be 4 0. Then they have Maryland. That's probably 5 0. And then at Northwestern, are you, are you 6 0? And then they've got Nebraska coming to, to, to town, who is probably going to be possibly 6 0 themselves. So, you know, it's interesting. I do like the fact that that Nebraska game is designated on uh, fbschedules.com as 12 o'clock slash 3.30 slash 4 slash 7.30 p.m. Other games are TBA, but Tony, they've got that narrowed down to literally every Big Ten time slot. So that'll be a good one. Yeah, you go past, I, I, you figure they're probably 5-1 and one at the worst going into that game. They got Washington after that. The Huskies just lost to Wazoo at, uh, Quest, State, at Quest Field out in Seattle. Then they go to Michigan State. That is certainly winnable. They got Michigan at home in Bloomington. That is maybe a little more winnable than it looked like. Another week off at the Buckeyes and home for Purdue the final week. That one's certainly winnable. It is not completely out of the realm of possibility that Indiana could go something like 10 and 2 this year without having more than one significant upset. Their schedule is such that they're missing a lot of the middle of the Big Ten and they're playing a lot of the bottom of the Big Ten, which certainly helps. But even an 8 and 4 Indiana this year would be just about get people probably dancing on the rooftops in Bloomington if they win eight games in Kurt Signetti's first year. So we will see how that one goes. Some some positive early surprises, some negative early surprises, and uh, some you know some things we're just going to have to kind of keep an eye on. But the season now about a quarter over for some teams. Buckeyes only two games into their season, but a lot of teams three games into their twelve game regular season. Season moving along a little quicker than you'd probably like. But uh, if you want to enjoy that season as much as possible, a great place to be doing that would be at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Right now, we're running our flash sale for ninety nine for your first month. So if you thought, I wonder, you know, I'd like to support those guys, but I wonder what I get. Well, a great way to do that would be to sign up today. Just go to BuckeyeHuddle.com and click on subscribe today at the top of the page. Get your first month for four ninety nine. That first month includes the Marshall game, the Michigan State game, the Iowa game, and the full week before, and then the aftermath for that Oregon game when there's going to be a lot to talk about. After that, you will probably know whether you want to stick around at BuckeyeHuddle.com with us. We suspect that you will, but a great way to do that would be to sign up today, get access to the site, 
Get access to all the coverage of the team from Tony, Kevin, and I, recruiting from Mark, our whole team of X's and O's gurus there, all to make you a smarter football fan, plus the huddle board presented by Jeff Ruby's Columbus. Fun and very active community. Lots of fun stuff going on there. Lots of fun conversations there about Ohio State and Michigan, and National College football, and all sorts of off-topic stuff as well. Lots of great stuff there. So we hope to see you there at BuckeyeHuddle.com. That'll do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.